The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Good evening and welcome into my state of mind. I am Dan York. You've been hearing about Zamborano Hospital a lot in the news, and most recently now, the Attorney General has weighed in to investigate the operations and some of the challenges that have been well reported up there. Well reported doesn't mean that we have all the answers though, and that's uh, some of the challenge that we found amongst many others with the transition between the Governor Raimondo administration and the Governor McKee administration. So it's a pleasure to have you aboard. Uh, tonight we're gonna look at this problem from a labor perspective. Uh, Michael Sabatoni is my guest. He heads up uh, the labor unions here in the state and represents hundreds of employees at the Zamborano Hospital. Know that the Eleanor Slater system is, is an umbrella system with locations in Cranston and Burrowville mostly. In Cranston, that is the mental health side with the facilities that exist there, the Story Center and, and, and others. And then Zamborano has, you know, multiple buildings on the campus up in Burrowville that handles the physical disability thing. Um, and of course, the twain uh, meets back and forth. The thing is, is that uh, the enrollment at Zamborano specifically has been diminishing as new patients have not been added. There's a conversation that we've had here for quite some time. There's a, a, a feeling that there's a, a plan not well publicly articulated that presents a problem. Um, so having said that, Adding to the drama is the resignation of the director who has a legitimate family issue, uh, an ill member of her family, uh, which was her cause to resign. But she has been under fire and not very accessible to people like me uh, to get fair and objective questions answered about that facility. So that's issue one. Then the attorney general weighed in. Here's how WPRI reported it. Eleanor Slater has come under intense scrutiny for months over allegations ranging from financial mismanagement to forced discharges. The Attorney General tells me he is, quote, very concerned about patient care at the hospital. As broad as it needs to be. I mean for Rhode Island Attorney General Peter Narona, the decision to launch an investigation into Eleanor Slater Hospital was the clear choice. We are aware of the situation. We're taking uh, steps to get answers. And at some point, we'll be in a position to share those answers with the public. Nerona says his office has been gathering information such as documents and conducting interviews with personnel for the past few weeks. Nerona will have several tools at his disposal as he investigates the state-run hospital system. The state's top prosecutor oversees the Office of the Healthcare Advocate, which takes on complaints about health care delivery. That's the office charged with protecting patients. What should patients know about your investigation? Well, what they should know is this, is that, you know, we're, we're looking into it, we're taking it very seriously, we're very concerned about, about the patient care. And then there's the Medicaid Fraud Control Unit, which can prosecute fraud connected to the state's Medicaid program. It's, it's about fraud, it's also about patient abuse and neglect. So if you put those, those three words together, you know, any uh, or all uh, or none of those could apply to the situation. Nerona says it's too soon to say if this investigation could lead to criminal charges. The Attorney General wouldn't provide any specifics about where the case is going, but did say he thought it was important for the public to know his office is engaged. Governor Dan McKee's office tells us he supports the AG's investigation. With the Target 12 investigators, Tolly Taylor, 12 News. Now, as soon as this story hits the airwaves, a day later, we find out that more ramifications with the Eleanor Slater Hospital Umbrella Organization, the interim CEO, Jennifer White, had her position reduced. Now, details when we recorded this program, and FYI, it was on Tuesday of this week due to some production schedule issues, uh, were not immediately available, but it just adds in to the, uh, the complications of Eleanor Slater, Zamborano, all of that. And so with that, we join Michael Sabatoni, who is, he's very involved in this conversation about the Zambrano Hospital and the Eleanor Slater system in general. You know, Mike is uh, a guy who answers questions when asked. And uh, we had a 
WPRI 12 story that ran last week that indicated that Mike got into uh, you know, a little tat -a tat tat on the telephone with the administration over at the Zambrano Hospital. And he's been at least quite clear with his perspective on that. So let's get that out of the way. I'm much more concerned, Michael, with the with the bigger picture, um, what you're seeing at the hospital, what's your general gist in, the, in terms of transition from one administration to the next and where we're going from here. And now the AG's uh, interest in this. So A, welcome, good to see you. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you for having me. So um, tell me that we, we've got a headline here that, that talks about you being on the phone. Look, you, and, 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 and getting into it and the, the, the medical director you know, claiming that he was right. feeling threatened, blah, blah, blah. Um, sure. Describe for me in, in, in really concise detail what that was about. This was part of your inquiry and, and kind of laying down what you more or less thought were the, the labor perspective on all this, correct? Yes, it was. It was a call that was taking place last Thursday, uh, and um, uh, it was uh, well, maybe two Thursdays ago. Um, and um, it's just been just a, a, a pent up frustration of dealing with the uh, administration, uh, especially of Zamborano Hospital. And, and I don't, when I mean the administration, I mean the administrators of that particular, um, uh, uh, you know, hospital. So, anyways. Uh, it's been um, lack of communication. It's been say one thing, do another. And you know, last uh, Thursday, so two Thursdays ago, phone call was regarding all of a sudden uh, uh, an alleged imminent, uh, you know, necessity to move patients from one end of the state to the other, very vulnerable patients because of a concern with the oxygen system. And uh, you know, I had done my diligence. I had uh, uh, used some of my um, um, influence with uh, of one of the contractors to get up there quickly to assess it because if it was imminent, I've got members up there, I've got patients up there, and uh, got a quick assessment that it really wasn't imminent and it could be fixed pretty damn quickly. And just the pushback and the reluctance of of the administration of that hospital to you know listen to the facts as we were telling them and just be stuck in their in their ways was uh, why the uh, the phone call got a, got a motion. But, yeah, so. Uh, so so, so okay. That so, that being said, let, let's get down to what you, you think the landscape is. Uh, before, before I dig in any further, if you can, quick, uh, quick view for the, the viewers here. You represent how many employees at that facility? Uh, I think I've got uh, over two hundred employees there that are represented under Labor's Local Union eight hundred eight. Uh, that uh, are the. Um, uh, support staff uh, for the administration, as well as the uh, the certified nurses, uh, or, or the registered nurses up in that facility that are represented by the nurses union. And, uh, you know, we do uh, everything else. We, we keep the, the place running, we, we clean it, we, we, we do, you know, run the kitchen, we run, it, it's got a little power plant, we run a treatment plant. So everything else that goes into the operation uh, of, of that building uh, is done by those local Italy. Okay, so look, obviously the concern, your agendas can be multi-level. You want to preserve jobs, no doubt, mm -hmm. um, but you also want to make sure the place is safe. Uh, it, it, I, I, I've learned over time that it's easy to take a shot at labor and say, ah, they're nothing but a bunch of job protectors, status mm -hmm. quo. Look, that, that hospital, um, in a lot of ways, with whatever advances and $65 million plans to, to build new facilities and upgrades right. and all that kind of stuff that may be coming down the line, ought to have a mindset of status quo. In this in this sense, the patients up there are in their last bus. When it comes to, a lot of them have outgrown their custodial help at home, parents right. at all, so some of them live there. Uh, Rhode Island has been, has been able to, through the whole Eleanor Slater system and Cranston on the mental health side and Zambrano more on the physical side, of course it's hybrid back and forth, but uh, has been able to offer this, this hospital of long-term last resort and it, it's residential for many of these people. So, so there's a lot to argue for in terms of keeping the thing quote the way it is correct it, there's no place else for for the, uh, these patients to go uh they the, the state act absolutely fills a need in the healthcare system by affording this opportunity for families that have exhausted every avenue that that, that this is the last place where uh these patients you know uh, can end up lucky to end up there because what i'll mention is as well and you know you mentioned you know the sometimes the stigma of, of labor 
Uh, I think if you followed this story and listened to the testimonials of the family and the, the families of the, of the patients that are in that facility, you know, the level of care, the professionalism, you know, just the, uh, you know, the overall dedication of my members to that facility and to those patients uh, are, are, are extraordinary. And they do some difficult tasks with some of our most vulnerable people in society that pretty much are, are you know, immobilized, incapacitated, that are totally dependent on, you know, in some instances, 100% on the care that's being given to them. And I, you know what? I'm damn proud of every man and woman that works in that facility and, and so damn proud when I hear those testimonies of, of real families on what they do and, and if there is an ability to make a quality of life better for these most vulnerable patients, my members do so and the, and the workforce up there uh, that services them has accomplished that goal and I'm damn proud of them. All right. We'll leave it. We'll leave it there for this segment. We'll, we'll get. We'll get down to what has been going on, the transition from Ramondo to McKee, uh, what you think uh, is actually happening and what should happen, and then we'll check in with you on just overall state of the state, so to, so to speak, on my state of mind. Mike Sabatoni, I'll uh, be right back. Stay with us. Back with Mike Sabatoni from uh, Rhode Island Labor. Mike's always, Mike's always confusing me. It depends on what business card I ask for, but today he's the business manager of Rhode Island Labor's District Council, and that means he's he's got an umbrella job, folks. There's a lot of there's a lot of councils and um, occupations that that fold under his uh, under his leadership. So, Michael, the, this is a hard thing for people to follow and to wonder why it's important to them. The, the, the families who are impacted by Zambrano Hospital and or the Eleanor Slater overall system certainly know why it's important to them. Um, two state legislators, I think, have done a good job out of Burrville, Senator De, De, De La Cruz and um, State Representative uh, uh, David, Place. David, David Place, thank you, uh, oh. who, who have, uh, you know, kind of stepped up for their constituencies. Look, it, 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 it there's a plan to, to build a new $65 million facility there. It seems to me that there's been some Medicaid complication. I don't know internally what was going on there. They lost Medicaid reimbursements. And what happened was last week that caused, I'm sure, you to get a little fiery on the telephone and, and to get some answers is this notion that, as an example, the fire marshal made a visit, took a look at the oxygen capability, said, yeah, it needs to be fixed. It's been broken for a long time. I don't think it's a danger to the patients, but you got to get it fixed. That's my understanding. And then the hospital was like, oh, and it was almost as if, you know, don't let a good uh, problem, you know, go to waste you know, in, right. in, in terms of what seemed to be kind of this stealth movement of patients amidst doctors who are telling stories about forced discharge processes and all right. that kind of a thing. To the governor's credit, the new governor, Dan McKee, he made a personal phone call to the fire marshal to say, is this true? Only to hear, no, it's not true. So right. you, you got to give him credit to that for that, I think. Tell, tell me what you really think was going on with that scenario and what does it represent for... Uh, following the truth of this story. I, I, again, I think the administration of that, that particular hospital uh, over the last six, eight months, uh, the distrust of the leadership uh, that, uh, that was uh, uh, coming out of that hospital, you know, lend itself to, you know, exactly what you're saying, morale for, for my members, morale for the nurses, morale for even the doctors. Um, and then, um, and then the uh, you know the interjection of of, of our rep and senator up there as well to say we want some straight answers. And I really do think there was some you know aspect of insubordination that was happening at that level because I don't know I would have conversations with the director that would say one thing and then a different thing would happen out in the field. And you know one of the examples that was most imminent was uh, the issue with the oxygen level, and it was almost like they were looking for. An excuse to, for reasons to continue down a path that was decided that they wouldn't continue down until we had the opportunity to assess the long-term need on what exactly does the state need to have to fulfill in the healthcare system. And I believe, and my members believe, and a lot of professional uh, doctors, some of which have resigned, believe, uh, as you mentioned in the last segment, that that hospital absolutely serves a need and it should be you know, invested for the long term so that we can continue to provide that need and that safety net for our most vulnerable uh, patients. And yeah, I, 
I'm yeah. not a medical professional, but you know, what some of the stuff that I was hearing as I've gotten into the weeds on this over the last eight months, quite frankly, was uh, was you know disappointing and asking for answers and not getting sufficient answers has led to this total mistrust and you know the, the circumstances we find ourselves in now. Yeah, I, I'm just trying to figure out, you know, whose agenda are we running here? Is it the former administrations? Is it the it certainly is the new administrations because they just got there and they're taking notes. Right. I know McKee doesn't come in with any predisposition. He's playing catch up on it now. Uh, you know, a new facility, I mean, certainly if a new facility is going to be built, you're going to have a role in that. So, I mean, that's not Correct. something that you're going to, you're not saying, oh, we don't want a new facility, I'm sure. Um, but one of the things that I'm, I'm looking at is the new facility seems to be categorized as a lesser, right? Uh, a, a, a more modern but lesser nursing home is type of rehab is type of facility that would, I think, leave a lot of these patients without a home. I'm, I'm, well, I'm very concerned about that. Let me say that the agenda, even with the Raimondo administration, was to stop on on the pro, uh, on a potential path going down. Once you know more and more people were aware of what that plan was by uh, the the, uh, uh, the 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 director and, and a few other uh, people in the in the administration, uh, that path was stopped and was decided. Okay, let's let's make an assessment and figure out. Look, take take into consideration all the stakeholders' recommendations, as opposed to just a few who thought this was a good idea. Uh, and now uh, it's charged with Governor McKee, who I also agree has done a good job under difficult circumstances. Who is, uh, in my opinion, doing the diligence now to uh, continue that assessment, make the long-term plan. I mentioned this when we were on the radio last week. This can't be a one, two, four year, or just like a like like a you know political term plan this has got to be a long-term plan by the way not only in zamborano and burrowville but we need to make investments in cranston as well we haven't you know maintained our infrastructure very well uh, in buildings or infrastructure and so I, so so to, to sum on this process. one sure so to summarize on this one um what do you think the attorney general's role here is uh i mean he's and clearly he sees himself as a health advocate so he wants to come in there and 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 and, and play that role. Uh, are you sniffing something that's worse, or do you think it's just more more good diligence that Peter Narona is is trying to achieve here? I mean, there were questions on you know billing, why we were billing, weren't billing. You know, I, I'm I'm sure all of that is going to come out. I'm not you know versed on to an extent where I you know what, what you hear the word was there fraud, was there this, was there that. I, I think obviously it comes under the attorney general's purview, and he's obligated. To look into that and if there was indeed mistakes or fraud or what or, or what, what have you while he's looking then you know that will be uncovered but there are a lot of questions with that as well on uh you know the decisions that were made and um and and why did we stop when we stopped why didn't we stop billing forward why did we stop taking admissions uh and all of those things and you know i think he'll get to the bottom of it and i think rightfully so he should look into it now do i think there's something there at the you know that would be you know fraud or criminal. I'm, I'm not saying that, but obviously it's in his uh, it's in his purview for him to take a look at that, and uh, and he's going to. All right, uh, we'll we'll leave it there. It'll be it's a play by play uh, every day, and uh, we'll always check in with your perspective. When we come back, I'd like a little bit of your thought on this new administration and uh, where we're going as we're trying to climb out of COVID with Mike Sabatoni. Stay with us. Michael Sabatoni, labor perspective, Mike, on the new administration. Um, tell me what you're thinking in the context of climbing out of COVID and rebuilding this economy. Well, I think he's got a uh, governor. McKee has got uh, you know a big job on his hands uh, of, of taking over the COVID vaccination, which I think he's done a you know a very good job of. Uh, and I do like uh, his uh, uh, reaching out to stakeholders in different arenas. I've talked to him a couple, on a couple of different occasions and things affecting infrastructure and uh, and the construction industry and 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 other things that are going to be uh, you know critical for us to to come out of this pandemic in a big way. Plus, when you combine that with uh, the, the stimulus monies that are going to come into the state to help us come out of that and being very practical and prudent on how we spend this, I'll just call it once in a lifetime opportunity to, for, for municipalities and the state to get it right. Uh, I'm, uh, I got confidence in the, in the governor. And I do think the one thing that I've seen in his short term uh, as governor is his ability to, to, to listen, ask people, not be afraid to ask people 
you know, uh, what their uh, perspective is, what they think on different things in their industries and their expertise, and then make a sound decision. So I think that's, uh, I think that's something that, I, that I'm uh, most pleased about. Well, I appreciate your, uh, your candor there. I, I, um, it, it's a good fresh start. Time will tell, right? But I will tell you that there's one guy watching the show going, oh, Christmas. And that's uh, Seth Magaziner, the treasurer, who, if you listen to all the pundits in, in the political world, thinks he's got labor's backing and it's a done deal. Um, sounds to me like you're a guy that's living in the present and, right. and judging it for its net worth, net worth. Yes. I have to live in the present and i think all rhode islanders do and you know we all have to rally around our leaders whoever they are and give them the opportunity uh and uh and hopefully all the support we can to succeed because if they fail ultimately we fail and we pay the price so you know i always give uh politicians and uh, you know people i work with the benefit of the doubt to work with them uh until such time as uh you know, they're ineffective or their inability to solve problems or tackle difficult things. And, uh, and uh, you know, no matter who it is, mayors, uh, you know, reps and senators. So, you know, that's our approach, Democrat, Republican. I don't care if you're in a position of power uh, that has the ability to not only affect my members, but also, you know, the state as a whole and the, the industries where I represent uh, people. You know, my job is to work with them, whether I like them or not. And. Uh, do my best to make sure they succeed, because if they succeed, my members succeed. And it's, you know, that's how I approach it. All right. Uh, good summary. Thank you uh, for your perspective. Uh, Michael Sabatoni, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to check in with you on both the TV and the radio on the Zamperino and whatever else is going on. Appreciate your perspective. Final word, Thank looking you. back on my state of mind. Stay with us. Thank you for having me. We will keep a fresh eye and ear on what's happening in Zamborano Hospital and so many things that are going on COVID-wise, J&J vaccine issues, all of that. So stay with us each weekend here on My State of Mind. Don't forget, weekdays 3 to 6 on WPRO. You have a great rest of your weekend. Good night.